Welcome back. Now we're going to continue and to look at how we can take information, data and knowledge and how we can use it in a system context. So first of all, we need to talk about what is a system. Now, a system can be defined as a set of elements that will help us to achieve a goal. So these elements will typically interact with each other and that will allow us to achieve a goal. So what is a system? A system typically takes something and it produces something. And we find these systems around us in everyday life. For example, if we talk about an automatic car wash, in order for that system to work, you need to have vehicles that goes into the system, that goes into it in order to be cleaned. You need to have people that's going to activate that process. You need to have cleaning materials. You need to have electricity. So all of these things would ultimately allow you to take a dirty car, to put it into the car wash, and when it reaches the end, it comes out, you should hopefully have a clean vehicle. Now, let's look at some of the basic components that we need in a system for it to function correctly. The first thing is we need to input something into that system. So we need to feed information into that system. That information will then be processed. And once processed, it will be turned into output. For example, if you want to phone a friend, the inputs would be you as an individual, you take your cell phone, that's your first input, you locate the application, once the application has been located, you scroll through the list and you select the person that you want to actually go and dial. Those are your inputs. The dialing process and after making your selection, that allows you to connect to that individual and your output will be the telephone call that goes through and you talking to the person on the other side. Now it's important that we realize that Whenever we talk about a system and the system components, these cannot function alone. So from input to process into output, we continuously need to have feedback. So if something goes wrong and we don't get the desired output, by having feedback we can correct the process in order to go and redo the whole system, redo all the steps and then achieve the output. For example, you're phoning your friend, you scroll through the list, you make a mistake and it starts to call the incorrect person. Feedback would tell you that, okay, you realize you made a mistake. Now you cancel that telephone call and you start the process again, trying to phone the correct person. Let's say for argument's sake, you're typing in a cell phone number and then suddenly you realize, or the system indicates that the number is not long enough or that it cannot make that connection immediately you're going to be presented with feedback and that feedback enables you to go and correct the input issue. Now it's important that we try to think about systems that we experience in our daily lives. So think about it. If you drive to work, you're actually working with a system, you're interacting with a system. So if we think about a motor vehicle, the input for that motor vehicle is you need a person in order to drive it. That person should know how to drive the vehicle. There should be a battery in order to start it. We should have petrol or diesel in order to get the engine running. Now let's have argument's sake that goes into processing. If all those components are present, the output would be your vehicle would start and you would be able to move from point A to B. But let's say for argument's sake that you don't have enough fuel in that particular vehicle. Feedback would be in the form of your dashboard. There might be a light that switch on that indicates that you're running out of fuel, prompting you to go and correct that. Otherwise, the whole system will shut down. Now, with its system, we can actually take it one step further and start to talk about an information system. Now, our information system works on the same principle. If we look at the definition, 
It's a set of interrelated components, similar to what we had with the ordinary system, that's going to collect, manipulate, store, and disseminate data and information, as well as have a feedback mechanism to, that will help us to go and achieve a specific objective. So if you think about your cell phone, if you want to make phone calls to your friends, the first thing is you need to collect the information. That information will be entered into an application, which will allow you to store that. And then later on, when you want to call them, you can just scroll through that list, pick the person that you want to dial, and it's going to enable you to achieve that particular objective. So why is information systems and strategies important for companies? We need to realize that these systems enable us to make more money. It's going to drive sales. Ultimately, it can ensure that your customers are happier. If a customer calls a company and they want help or feedback, if that information is available, then you can quickly assist that customer and generally they would be happy with your company. It will also assist us with key business decisions, the types of decisions that we need in order to run our company effectively. So, to conclude this section, we need to realize we live in an information economy. Information is around us, it's used in various contexts. It has value and it allows us to conduct commerce and to exchange the information with other individuals, with other companies, and it actually provides value to our daily lives. Now let's recap. What are some of the components of an information system? First of all, similar to what we had with a system, we're going to input something into that system. So we're going to collect information. That information will be processed, so we're going to manipulate and store the information. That information will be turned into output, so it's going to be disseminated. And then we will continuously need to have feedback in order to make sure that if there's a mistake with the information that we can actually go and fix and correct that. Now let's look at the following example and see how these system components can be applied. So imagine you standing in front of an ATM machine. So the first component is inputs. What do I need to put into that system in order for that system to work? So the first thing is, you need to have an individual. You, as a person, need to go to the machine to interact with that system. To activate it, you need to put in a bank card, so that's an input. Once a card has gone in, it's going to start with some processing. It's going to come back with feedback, so on the screen it's going to ask you for a password or PIN code. You're going to enter the PIN code. That again is an input. It's going to validate your PIN code and if it's valid it's going to allow you to enter that particular system. So do you realize that we're already starting to talk about input processing feedback and outputs throughout this whole system? So as you progress you might select whichever transaction you want to do. Let's say you want to withdraw money and then if the money is in your account, it goes through processing, they will go and validate that. And then if it's successful, your output will be you actually get the money and you get a receipt that you actually withdrew money from your account. Now, when we talk about systems, it actually becomes a little more complicated. We need to realize that the information from one system can either be obtained from other systems or it can be sent to another system. So the important thing here is if you look at this particular image, in this case we receive information from various other systems. So the banking system might be linked to other banks, it might be linked to other organizations, your company that pays in your paycheck. So that will typically become the input, it goes through to processing, it becomes the output and we still have continuous feedback. So what we have is the output of another system might become the input of this current system. 
and then our outputs from our system might yet again become the inputs of yet another system. So systems typically interact with each other. Now if we look at the, the two concepts here, system boundary and environment, the system boundary is the direct vicinity of that system. So if I just talk about the ATM machine, that would be the system boundary. In order for you to work with that system, you need to approach the machine, put in a valid card, put in a pin, and then you interact with it. So you enter the boundary of that particular system. However, that system is placed in an environment. It might be placed in another building. It might be placed outside a bank. It requires the interaction of people. For example, the system environment could it um, exist of people putting money into that ATM machine, the security people. It could exist by having various other systems linked to that, for example, getting access to how much money is in your account, all those kind of things. We might have money that should be placed into that actual system. So yet again, for that system to work within its boundary, there are other factors in the system environment that could contribute or hinder the way that it's actually used. So let's conclude the system, the information systems aspect. So what did we learn up to this stage? We said that information system is a set of interrelated components that collect, manipulate and store and disseminate data and information. It's going to provide a feedback mechanism and that will allow you to generally meet an objective. So, what is input? Input is the activity of gathering and capturing data. Process, transferring that data into meaningful outputs. Outputs, useful information or objects that you will receive from this particular system in many cases in the form of documents, reports, um, touchable products. And then feedback, information that the system use where it might require changes to the inputs in order to reach proper outputs. Now let's say for example in the next section I'm going to ask you this question. You have a company and I'm asking you what will happen to your company within the next few years if 50% of your customer base will stop using your products. So within two years, if half of your customers disappear, what's going to happen to your company? And the answer is actually quite easy. Your company will fail. So what did we do? We've made a forecast. So forecasts allow us to predict future events. So if you think back to our first discussion about data being turned into information that allows us to obtain knowledge and then from knowledge we can start to do forecasts. We can try to predict future events. Where do we find these? For example, if we look at something like rainfall information, countries would typically collect rainfall information at various locations, various times of the year which would allow them to try to predict what might happen. Or let's say for argument's sake, if there's a drought, drought situation, what were the effects a few years ago? So what do we need to do in order to learn from the past? So that concludes the system components section. In the next section, we're going to start to look at computer-based information systems.